I think that's the idea of humanness. I'm going to write that down for a future topic. Humanness, what does it mean? And now to finish out our day, we have a very interesting story about gender and storytelling and how biases are created in young children. Research on children's books and gender stereotypes has relied mostly on content analysis. A team collected a corpus of 247 books commonly read to children ages five and under and asked adults to rate on a five-point scale how strongly the words in the book's text were associated with masculinity and femininity. An overall gender bias score was calculated for each book. And here are the books. The researchers also used word embeddings, a machine learning method to measure words, gender associations beyond the adult ratings. The approach identified patterns in gender-related word neighbors, which are terms that typically appear together across large bodies of text, such as Mary and Christmas in American English. The analysis showed that children's books vary wildly in the amount of gender associations they contain, from strongly male to strongly female. We found that books that we estimated to be gender biased based on adult judgments also tended to be biased when we used this automatic mathematical method. This is important because it suggests that some of the gender associations that emerge in adulthood begin to appear in the statistics of children's texts and could potentially be learnable from exposure to children's books. Now we talked about censorship in Texas a couple of weeks ago and how books are getting banned and put out to pasture. This needs to move over just a little bit. Thank you. Another unexpected result of this storybook gender association was that children tended to be exposed to books that conveyed gender stereotypes about their own gender. Girls tended to be read books about girl characters, and boys tended to be read books about boy characters. These findings are important because they suggest that books may inadvertently be teaching young children about gender stereotypes. So that's a fascinating conundrum as a parent or as a school teacher. What do you do with books and how they influence young minds? And I'm reminded of a, a, a teaching method that Jana and I would use in teaching ASL to hearing students across a wide variety of economic strata. And one of the final presentations for these upper level ASL courses was to take a famous fairy tale like Cinderella and reduce it down into an ASL story. And what we found over time and experience is that the students we taught who were from a lower economic strata than other students, based on, we'll say, tuition rates, which tended to be minority students in the lower tuition schools, state schools, public schools, than the private institutions that tended to be more white-centered and more money-oriented. So you have the power majority in the Ivy League, let's say, and the lesser economic depressed minority stereotype student in the public school. And the point of that differentiation is this, because it's very interesting, is in the high tuition schools, the students would say, okay, they'd send you a fairy tale and you'd present it. And what we discovered in the lower, more economically disadvantaged students is 
they didn't know what a fairy tale was. And in conversations with them over years in different groups of students, we slowly became aware that fairy tales were not a part of the growing up of the childhood of these students. Now this is not gender-based, what we were just discussing, but it's economically based, I believe, which is very interesting. And then, so we tried to modify this over time. So, okay, so we talked to, we, we would become aware, so fairy tales, do you know what a fairy tale is? And most of them did not know, and we would assign a fairy tale. And then they would try to learn that and then break it down into ASL, which didn't work because if you don't know the fairy tale, if you haven't retold the fairy tale or seen movies of the fairy tale, it's very difficult in a week or two to read the story, understand the story in English, and then reduce it down grammatically, syntactically to a story that you at your level of ASL can share and, and, and perform as part of a class. Reduce it down from something very complex to something very simple. It is an adaptation and a talent. So then we modified that a little bit for all places we taught to Aesop's Fables. Now, the high tuition students knew what an Aesop fable was, they could name one. And the lower, more disadvantaged economically students knew about Aesop's fables, but they didn't really know the details. So then we would print out fables because they're usually very short and we'd hand them out and assign them. And that worked well. On all levels. And then we also just for a couple of years tried something a little bit different where we would give them a choice. Fairy tale, a fable, or a Bible story, a religious story. We wanted something that people knew that they were aware of the class, the rest of the class, that could then be reduced down to a story that could be shared in ASL. So other people could kind of know where the story was going. And that experiment was fascinating as well. Because, generically speaking, the public schools students tended to choose the Bible story, the religious story, over the fairy tale or the fable. And the high tuition schools would usually do the fairy tale because that was their exposure, that was their childhood, that's what they held on to and, 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 and appreciated. Not a lot of religious retellings on the upper level. So what does that say? I don't know. But it's very interesting that the lower economic kids who tended to come from minority households knew their Bible, knew a Bible story, and were very excited, which is really important to translate that story into ASL for presentation in the class. And I say excited because you want learning to be fun and not intimidating and not overwhelming and not, oh, I have to go find a story. Well, we got that reaction a little bit in the public institutions when it was a fable or a fairy tale. That was an assignment that had to be done. That was something that had to be figured out. But, when it became a religious story that they knew and believed and practiced, that became enjoyable to them. That became part of them. And their stories blossomed in ways you could not imagine when you're trying to figure out the best way to teach storytelling from one language to another language. So gender, economics, opportunity, what your parents read to you at night shapes and defines the morality and the perspective of the person. Be it gender stereotypes, economic stereotypes, the common rhythms of storytelling that were embedded in you as a child and that stay with you through your adult life. 
happen to you when they are exposed to you as a young person. They can later be recalled and shared in an ASL class as your story for the final exam. And on that note, I thank you so much for being here. It's been a wonderful, interesting day. Weird weather going on in New York. Snow is in the forecast. Maybe it'll fall, maybe it won't fall. I'll be here tomorrow again, 9 a.m. Eastern. If you want to get in touch, you can email me, david at bowls.tv. If you have a question about disability or different abilities or American Sign Language, you can find Jana in email, Jana at bowls.tv. And for now, I wish you a wonderful day, a glorious evening, and a happy moment in time until I see you tomorrow. Thank you for being here.